Well, good morning, good afternoon. Thank you for that lovely introduction. And thank you to um, Professor Sang Sanghera um, and the whole team at the University of Kent for putting this together and thinking of inviting me. Um, it is quite a special year for Adam Smith, 300th birthday. Celebrations are happening all over the world. I was um, in Edinburgh and Glasgow earlier this year, and it seems like the party just never ends. <laughs> um, and I, I've said to many people um, that celebrating Smith's birthday is actually quite a special thing when you think about the number of celebrations that have happened in Smith's long and storied afterlife, there have been lots of anniversaries celebrating a single book, right? The centenary of the wealth of nations, the bicentenary of the wealth of nations. We, we tend to celebrate just the publication of one book. And that's unsurprising given Smith's reputation, but it is quite interesting. And I think very remarkable that scholars around the world, including yourselves, are gathered to celebrate the life of Adam Smith, right? The kind of whole person, his ideas from different disciplines and backgrounds. And I think that he would be, you know, were he alive today, he would be both pleased and embarrassed because he was a very private man. <laughs> so in any case, um, I'll be sharing a bit of my work today. Um, as, as Charles mentioned, I work on the reception of Adam Smith. So what does that mean? My work is really about who Adam Smith was and who he became in American intellectual history. Smith, like Marx, maybe like Locke and a few others, ranks among uh, a number, but a very small number of thinkers whom many people have read, but few understand. His popular reputation tends to be very one-sided, usually provokes very strong reactions in one way or another. I'm sure many of you have um, stumbled across an ordinary person. They say, what do you work on? And you, and you say, oh, I work on Adam Smith. And they go, oh, you like Adam Smith? And then you have to explain yourself. Right? At least this has happened to me. And what first interested me in Smith's reception history is that gulf between popular caricatures of Smith on the one hand and his reputation among scholars on the other. So how, when, and why did Smith become primarily known as an economist, especially a free market economist, rather than as an enlightenment moral philosopher? And among the many canonical thinkers that one could reference, put on a logo, use as a mascot for think tanks, why do people still return to Adam Smith? One of my advisors um, told me, you know, if you think about all the works that were published in the 18th century, how many of those do we still read today? According to one very rough metric, um, I've used this in my book and in other talks, the Open Syllabus Project, which collects data from syllab college syllabi across the United States, the Wealth of Nations ranks 44th most assigned work on college syllabi. That is astonishing if you think about it. And I guarantee you not everybody has actually read the Wealth of Nations, but the fact that it appears on that many syllabi across the nation is very surprising. And there aren't that many other 18th century texts on that list. So reception history, in my view, is what I call like a line between intention and impact. It explains the difference between what Smith might have originally intended or meant when he wrote the theory of moral sentiments or the wealth of nations, and then what subsequent readers made of those works, what they did with his ideas. And in pursuing this line of inquiry, I'm interested less in providing a definitive count, account of what Smith originally intended or meant, than I am in explaining the demands that readers have brought and continue to bring to his text. And I say that taking reception history seriously requires that we try to see different possibilities for a text in different times and places, right? How have readers past and present engaged with Smith's text? What were the terms on which they engaged with Smith's text? What were the questions they were asking? So in the time that I have today, I wanna to draw out three lessons from the history of Smith's reception in America. And really broadly, the first is a general point about the constructed nature of Smith's reputation and what we learn from ongoing contestation about his legacy. The second is a point about the elusiveness about a really historical Smith. And the final point has to do with what I call the politics of political economy. So first, Smith's well-known reputation as the father of economics or the father of free market economics is a belated construction. Now, this seems quite obvious, but I'm gonna kind of walk you through some of the different stages where we see that um, reputation get constructed. So during Smith's lifetime, an elite cadre of American statesmen and thinkers saw his works as contributions to the enlightenment science of man. 
Both the theory of moral sentiments and the wealth of nations were well known and considered important texts during the founding era. We have examples like Thomas Jefferson recommending the theory of moral sentiments in a list of books for private libraries. The physician Elihu Hubbard Smith recommends the theory of moral sentiments to his sister, saying that she should direct your principal attention to writings as they will assist you in forming just notions of morality and criticism. And we see in 1876, sorry, 1786, <laughs> that the work is being recommended among various members of the Adams family. You know, we have Abigail Adams reading it, Charles, um, Charles Adams, um, John Quincy Adams checks it out from the Harvard Library, and then eventually John Adams in 1790 and 1791 effectively, you know, just cuts and pastes <laughs> entire paragraphs of the theory of moral sentiment into a series of essays called the Discourses on Davila, which he published between 1790 and 1791, really offering a social critique of the social power of wealth and how it would undermine a kind of democratic fabric in, in the American Republic. Now, the wealth of nations has a different kind of practical relevance and importance during the founding era. By the mid 1780s, it was being used as a primary textbook for the first college courses on political economy taught at the College of William and Mary. Thomas Jefferson and James Madison both recommend it to be on a list of books for Congress. And um, Jefferson even hailed it as the best book extant on political economy in 1790. He later changes that position when Jean Baptiste Say's Treatise of Political Economy comes out. And uh, most importantly, or maybe most notably, Alexander Hamilton directly incorporated ideas from the wealth of nations into his treatises on um, national bank, on public credit, and the report on manufacturers. So Smith's ideas, we see them being used in these instances, um, serve as theoretical and technical apparatuses by which people like Alexander Hamilton could make claims about how national wealth was generated and how it might be encouraged by the presence of a strong and active national government. Now, most striking for those familiar with Hamilton's political economy is that Hamilton's able to use Smith's ideas to support a political vision of economic nationalism that rests on the very things that Smith opposed, things like subsidies, the encouragement of manufacturers, and even moderate protective tariffs. So when we step back and take, take a kind of bird's eye view of these different uses of Smith in the late, late 18th century, we, we see that it's possible that people could read Smith and use his ideas independently from his intellectual authority. The theory of moral sentiments is just one of many books for individuals to use to reflect on private virtue and morality. Francis Hutcherson's um, was also very popular, Thomas Reed, Dougald Stewart. The Wealth of Nations was a useful resource for American statesmen who are trying to figure out how to manage a fledgling national economy in enlightened fashion. But neither work really exerts any fundamental importance. And perhaps most notably, in almost every single one of these instances, there's no direct appeal to Smith as the father of economics, right? People aren't invoking his name as if his name itself had power. They're using his ideas. Smith's neither revered nor wholly ignored. His ideas are practically useful, but they're not paradigm shifting yet. So it's not until the 1820s that Americans begin to treat the science of political economy as not just useful and practical for statesmen, but a, but a field of knowledge production that's worth pursuing for the sake of producing knowledge about this thing called political economy. The expansion of instruction in political economy in higher education um, and the explosion of new textbooks written for instructional pur purposes cements Smith's foundational status among American readers. However, the significance of the wealth of nations reputation as the foundation and textbook of science of the science of political economy went beyond the simple fact that Smith became a kind of founding figure. Smith's American interpreters begin to rethink the distance between Smith's time and their own. They postulated the extent of the wealth of nations' timelessness, but they also saw the ways in which it was bound by its context. So in making claims about what or which aspects of Smith's scientific truths transcended the time for which they were written, like the division of labor or the distinction between productive and unproductive labor, the definition of wealth, and last but not least, the issue of free trade, all of these issues become um, points for American readers to contest, right? What did Smith get right? 
what was timeless, what was bound by its context. And they establish a pattern for evaluating Smith's legacy. One of my favorite examples is that uh, American professors get very mad at Smith's distinction between productive and unproductive labor because clergymen and professors would have been considered unproductive. <laughs> now, <laughs> one of the central arguments that I make throughout the book is that successive constructions of Smith's significance and political import often tell us less about the content of Smith's ideas and more about the grounds on which his interpreters believed his authority rested. So what does that mean? So in the 18th century, Smith's ideas about banking, factions, the division of labor, sympathy, vanity, and, ambi and ambition are useful for people like John Adams or Alexander Hamilton because they appeal to a kind of enlightenment sensibility about how to understand man in society. In the 19th century, assumptions about the scientific or timelessness of, of the science of political economy, its universality or its national context, that, that, um, that assumption exerts newfound power in political debate. So free traders, for example, people debating um, uh, kind of the, 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 um, the tariff schedule in the United States, they clamor on the Congress floor, laying down their principles, they say, upon the authority of Adam Smith, who has done more to enlighten the world of political economy than any man of modern times. They say he is the founder of the science, and so you should follow what he says. And those kinds of arguments get recycled again and again. Right. So for free traders, free trade is justified because it was grounded in the scientific theories advanced by the father of political economy. But on the other hand, you have anti-free traders or um, people in, in favor of um, tariff reform or um, um, protectionism will say things like, even Adam Smith, the apostle of free trade, made exceptions for the home market and said that the home market is the most important of all market. So regardless of which side you're on, you still appeal to the authority of Adam Smith to make your claims. Perhaps the most famous belated construction is that of the Chicago School Smith of the 20th century. By conceptualizing Smith as the author of the price mechanism, Chicago economists unified and defended the substantive propositions of economics that had come under assault after the Great Depression. And these were ideas like free markets under specific conditions could be self-regulating and self-stabilizing, and that the freedom to pursue one's rational self-interest underpinned the automaticity of markets. So this idea of the invisible hand of the market was underwritten by the scientific rationality of the price mechanism, and that the invisible hand of the market triumphed over the messy irrationality and the heavy hand of politics. Now, that view, of course, has since been challenged in revisionist Smith scholarship beginning in the late 1970s. And it's worth underscoring how that tide has shifted in more recent years. Beyond refuting the very stubborn Das Adam Smith problem, um, you know, the idea that the theory of moral sentiments and the wealth of nations were somehow philosophically incompatible texts or that Smith had changed his mind. Um, and beyond refuting what I've called the Chicago Smith problem, it's been a very pervasive theme of, of contemporary Smith scholarship to treat Smith as a moral theorist, not an economist of capitalism, or, or not just an economist of capitalism. So, so this brings me to my second big point. Smith's reception history reveals the elusiveness, the complexities of even the best attempts to recover an authentic historical Smith. So it's without question that much of contemporary revisionist scholarship relies heavily on historical work or historical methodology, though often their primary intention is not strictly to provide a comprehensive reconstruction and interpretation of Smith's works per se. Rather, a large strand of second wave revisionist scholarship provides an imminent critique of modern capitalism with Smith as their guide. Similarly, renewed interest in the relationship between Smith and Rousseau on the subject of inequality or the corruption of commercial society serve a clear rehabilitative purpose. Right? When we frame Smith as a, a kind of commentator on the moral corruption of commercial society, we cast Smith as a moral theorist whose philosophy was not only compatible but foundational to his political economy in order to show that he was a sympathetic, even a radical social scientist who cared deeply about inequality and saw room for the use of the state to achieve the ends of distributive justice. 
Now, these re readings represent concerted efforts, I think, to recover and explicate a version of commercial society, and by extension, modern capitalism, that is defensible on moral grounds, not just economic ones. And that scholars have looked for a much more well-rounded and contextualized version of Smith for the moral foundations of capitalism is by no means new. In the late 19th century, for example, we saw a flurry of new commentary around Smith's historical significance, in large part because key elements of Smith's corpus had just been discovered, chief among them the first set of student notes on the lectures on jurisprudence in 1895. Um, Smith's library was cataloged, um, new interpretive problems like Das Adam Smith problem emerged, and new biographies were written in the late, late 19th century. And people begin asking questions about the consistency, compatibility, and contemporary relevance of Adam Smith for American audiences. And they refract their readings of, um, of Smith through a much wider methodological debate about whether economics and the American political economy itself can and should be directed toward ethical ends. I find this debate fascinating because economists today are still having that debate, right? Should economics be directed toward what is or what ought to be? But in the late 19th century, cohorts of American economists received their training in Germany during the 1870s through the 1880s, and they brought back these historicist, um, historicist methodology and contributed to a lively debate over the ethical and political boundaries of economic science in America. And these prominent new generation thinkers, as they are now called, included people like Richard T. Ely and E.R.A. Seligman, believed that political economy had foundations in social ethics that, quote, self and others, the individual and society are united in one purpose. Moreover, Ely believed that Smith himself expressed a conviction that, quote, those exertions of the natural liberty of a few individuals, which may endanger the liberty of the whole society, are and ought to be restrained by the laws of all governments, right? So liberty needs limits. E.R.A. Seligman, who is one of the most ferocious reviewers of new works on Smith for economics journals, tirelessly tried to defend Smith from misinterpretation and misattribution by historicizing Smith, declaring that we must not make Smith responsible for the faults of his disciples. But in their attempt to historicize Smith, both Ely and Seligman were not only trying to subvert the neoclassical paradigm of their time or just combat a kind of very laissez-faire polemical version of Smith, they were subtly and radically remaking Smith in their own image. Smith's labor theory of value, according to Ely, made labor central and pivotal. And those who would protest against labor legislation in their time, so in, in, as, as Ely is writing these commentaries on Smith, this is coming on the heels of some of the most violent labor agitations and kind of suppression of, 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 of labor riots and, and protests and strikes in the United States. Um, so Ely's kind of using Smith to remind people that Smith himself described regulations that favor the workmen as always just and equitable. In other words, Ely made Smith a champion of labor in a time of crisis. In Seligman's words, had Smith lived in 1886, he would surely no less have been in the vanguard of the new school. So though these examples are separated by over a century, I think they show how attempts to recover a more historical Smith show how difficult it is to surrender a text completely to history, to turn to it without bringing to bear our own expectations and prejudgments about what that text must be saying. And this is especially the case with the text like The Wealth of Nations, a text whose propositions and analysis are often assumed to be timeless because questions about modern political economy are timeless. So this brings me to my third and final point. Smith's reception history in America reveals what I call the politics of political economy. And I mean this in at least two senses. First, immediate political and economic circumstances shape ideas that are produced about the econo about American political economy. In other words, economic ideas are not created in a vacuum. This is obvious, but worth restating, if only because political economic theories, especially spits, are often seen as having kind of inherent transcendent qualities. But the second meaning of the politics of political economy is this. The po that political economy is a language of authority. And the way in which various readers, writers, and speakers have portrayed Smith, 
used his ideas and made claims about his importance are discursive choices. They can be used as tools or weapons and they reveal as much as they can conceal. So for instance, in the antebellum trade debates, the insistence on Smith's authority as the founder of the science by legislators from the cotton South cast the issue of free trade in the universalizing language of political economy, thereby averting and ultimately unsuccessfully occluding the polarizing language of slavery, right? And also ignoring the fact that a national economy built on free trade depended on the expansion of slave labor. The Chicago Smith relied on a conceptualization of free markets as not only freedom enhancing, but scientifically and objectively validated. But by leaning into the outsized role of self-interest and the invisible hand, they deliberately minimize the importance of other forces and institutions beyond the market, right? Forces and institutions that Smith himself discussed at length in his other works. Even contemporary discursive shifts in referring to Smith as a moral theorist of commercial society has its blinding effects. To treat the problems of modern capitalism as if they were anticipated by Smith, qua moral philosopher, not only too readily assumes an analogousness of political and economic circumstances between his time and ours, but it also risks devolving problems of politics into mere questions of morality and virtue. Claims about Smith's contribution, his relevance or irrelevance to contemporary issues, his approach to a political economy, in and as against moral philosophy, those are all political statements. Whether they're statements about the scientific validity of free trade, the rationality and morality of markets over state direction, or the causes and consequences of economic inequality in modern society. So as we struggle today in the 21st century to orient ourselves in its various crises, you know, some new, some old, we're sure to hear these calls for us to return to Smith in the hopes that we might find answers to our questions about the moral foundations of capitalism or a theory of why capitalism might be a force for good or ill. But as a reception historian, I would urge that we, um, um, sorry, I lost my place here. <laughs> I, I, I hope that um, kind of a reception history will serve as a map of sorts, right? It can reveal the past that we've trodden to arrive at where we are in terms of our orientation towards Smith, but it also forces us to be clear about the demands that we are bringing to Smith and his ideas today. So I'll stop there and turn it over to Ian.